Refuge is a safe place. 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 For all people. For all people. For all people. To explore and restore their faith. To explore and restore their faith. To explore and restore their faith. In Jesus Christ and his church. In Jesus Christ and his church. Refuge is a safe place for all people to explore and restore their faith. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Refuge. Moms, it's already been said, but happy Mother's Day Eve because tomorrow is Mother's Day. We welcome you all here tonight. As was mentioned, we are in the series finale as we wrap up our time in the book of Ruth. And tonight, because it is Mother's Day, I thought we would focus on the three moms of this story as we look at a story of Mother's Day redemption. As I mentioned as we ended last week, this is a beautiful, well-written story. It has all the components that you would learn in the best creative writing classes. There's an exposition, and there's an exciting incident, and a crisis rises, and there's action, and there's a cliffhanger, and then there's a climax, and then eventually there is resolution. So to retell the story, because I know some of you, it's your first time here, and I want to catch you up where we're at in the story, plus I just want to lay a foundation for tonight. Let's just go through each of those components of the story. It began in chapter 1, verse 1, and it started with an exposition. It's setting the stage. It says, in the days when judges ruled Israel. And that may not mean a lot to us, but let me take a moment to help you out with what it meant when the judges ruled Israel. Israel. And to do that, we're going to go to the book of Judges real quick. Chapter 19, this is set in and around Bethlehem where our story takes place. And here's from the book of Judges when our story takes place. It says a Levite and his concubine, if you don't know what that is, it's a sex partner, are traveling and decide to rest for the night. They sit in the main square and they're hoping to be offered a safe place to stay. Well, kind of like when Jesus went to Bethlehem with his family or before he was born, no one offers them a place to stay. Apparently, Bethlehem has an issue with hospitality. Finally, an old man comes along and he offers this man and his concubine a place to stay. And he gives them an ominous warning. He says, it's very unsafe for you to be here, especially out in the open like this. Soon in this story, we learn why he gives that warning. A lust-filled mob surrounds the house, demanding that the man be turned over so that they can sexually violate him. Is homosexuality a sin? We've talked about this in a church. It absolutely can be when a group of men request to gang rape another man. When the mob refuses to disperse, let me read straight to you from the text. Judges 19, this is the old man speaking. Verse 24, he says, Here, don't take this man, take my virgin daughter and this man's concubine. I will bring them out to you and you can abuse them and do whatever you like. Verse 25, but they wouldn't listen to him. So the Levite, this man, took hold of his concubine and pushed her out the door. The men of the town abused her all night, taking turns, raping her until morning. I asked if homosexuality was a sin. Is heterosexuality a sin? It can be, absolutely, when a group of men take turns raping a woman. This is the time of the judges. This is the time in which this story is code. By the way, later this husband, they call him in the story, proceeds to chop up his concubine into 12 pieces and FedExes her body parts out to the rest of the tribe leaders in the country. This is the time of the judges. I say all of that so that we have a place and a time that this story is set. It is dark days, especially dark if you are a female. And so then there's an inciting incident. It's what begins to move the story along. And so that inciting incident is there is a severe famine that has come upon the land. And so we meet this guy, Elimelech, and he moves his wife, Naomi, and their two sons outside of Israel, who could blame them with all that's happening there, to a country called Moab. While in Moab, Elimelech dies. This is a patriarchal culture. Women are of very little value, but thankfully... Naomi does not have a husband, but she has two sons. And so this is our first mom in the story. Mom number one is Naomi. Naomi has two sons. They marry Moabite women. 
Those women's names are Orpah and Ruth. Both of those two women would like to be mothers, especially to sons, but they're both unable to conceive. Ten years later, Naomi's two sons, the husbands, they die. In verse 5, we're told this, this left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. As a wife, as a mother, as a daughter, when you lost the male members of your family, you lost everything. You lost the land, you lost the livestock, and most important, it's hard for us to understand that, but most important in this culture, you lost their name, and the name was everything. And so that's the crisis. So the action now in the story begins to rise. We hear that there is food back in Bethlehem. So our three women, they begin a trip back. But Naomi stops them and she says, no, girls, you stay here. At least you have a chance to get remarried. Maybe you can become a concubine, but I'm going home to die. And Orpah says, that makes a lot of sense. She's obedient. She says, okay. But Ruth doesn't always follow the rules. And she's been watching this woman, Naomi, who has become like a mother to her. And in this mother to her, she has seen something different. And so she says to Naomi, no, where you go, I will go. Where your people will be, my people will be, your God will be my God. And so Ruth has this conversion of faith. Your God will be my God because I have seen, Naomi, my mother, how you love me. And because of that, I want to follow your God and be with your people. But just as Ruth's faith is beginning to blossom, Naomi is in the midst of a crisis of faith. Verse 21, it says, this is Naomi. She said, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. I know from experience with friends, there is no deeper pain than losing a child. And Naomi has lost not one child, but two. And she's lost her husband would be her primary supporter. And let me remind you again, this is still the time of the judges, a very dark and difficult time when women are unsafe. And so these women, they have no widow's pension, they have no social security benefits, they have no food to eat, they are destitute and desperate. And Ruth says, all right, I've got this new faith, let me put it into action. And so chapter 2 began with her um, going out and gleaning in the fields. This is an Old Testament law. It's like the Israel welfare system. They go down to the local food pantry and they pick up along the corners of the fields. And we learn quickly, though, again, that Ruth is a bit of a rule breaker. Instead of gleaning from the outside corners of the field, she goes straight down the middle of the field behind the harvesters. And as she's doing this, it says it just so happens, which is Bible for look what God is about to do, the pantry that she is gleaning from is owned by a man. We're introduced to him. His name is Boaz. Boaz is a powerful man. He is successful. He has great influence. But he also happens to be a good dude, we're told. And he loves the Lord, and he brings the Lord into his business. And so Boaz, he takes notice of Ruth. We don't know if it's because of romance or because she's going down the middle of the field instead of staying on the corners, but she notices, or Ruth, Boaz notices Ruth And he becomes a safe person to this vulnerable foreigner. He provides her with food. He provides her with encouragement. He introduces her to other safe people. Last week, chapter 3, we saw just how safe Boaz truly was. Naomi's faith, when all this food comes in from Boaz, her faith is revised because of his generosity. And so she's now able to move forward and look beyond herself and starts developing a plan for her daughters, long-term safety and security. And so Naomi says to Ruth, she says, get cleaned up, go to the threshing floor, wait for Boaz to be in good spirits, drink a little bit, fall asleep, then uncover his feet. And when he wakes up, he will tell you what to do. If you didn't hear that story, you can go back and listen on our podcast this week. And again, I remind you, this is the time of the judges. It is so important that when this setting is in place, and so women are not safe. So her going out to do this meant so much could go wrong. And so this is a plan of desperation. It gives you some indication of how bad things are. She goes out, she follows through with this plan. Boaz wakes up, but then Ruth, the little rule breaker, 
she changes her mother's script. And I'll say to you moms in the room, you know you've raised your child right when they don't do what you tell them to do, but do something better. So that's what's happening here. And so while Naomi is looking out for Ruth, Ruth is actually looking out for the entire family, including their legacy. And so she puts a spin on these two different old Jewish laws. The kinsman redeemer law said if a man was forced to sell his land, the nearest living relative was to purchase that land. So it kept it in the tribe, it kept it in the family. And then she throws out the Leviterite law that says if a man died, his blood brother was to marry his widow. If they had a son, the son would take the dead man's place in the family tree. But the problem is, Boaz is not Elimelech's brother, nor is he the nearest living relative. He is beyond the reach of these two laws. But as we'll see, he's not beyond the spirit of the law. Now, given the traditional views on these laws, there was a chance that this rich, powerful, native-born man would agree with this interpretations of a poor, powerless immigrant woman. Well, it turns out Boaz was willing to evolve his beliefs. He's a bit of a rule breaker too, and has the courage to put the spirit of the law over the action of the law. And so as we ended last week, it was a cliffhanger. There is another relative, another family redeemer who is closer than Boaz. And he says, no matter how much, Ruth, I want to redeem your family, there is a law that I am bound by, but I have a plan. And that's where we left off, and we pick up tonight in chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Boaz went to the town gate and took a seat there. The town gate, it's a cross between the town hall, the courthouse, and the Starbucks. It's where everything happened in this city. The horses would come in and out of town. The workers would come in and out of town. It is a place of action and a place where deals went down. And so, reminder, again, this is um, the old little town of Bethlehem. This is where all this is happening. So, it's the same place that that gang rape that we read about in Judges happened, and it's the same place where Jesus was born. This is where this takes place in its town gate. It says, just then, as if on cue, the family redeemer he had mentioned came by. So, Boaz called out to him, come over here and sit down, my friend. I want to talk to you. So, they sat down together. Verse 2 says, then Boaz called 10 leaders from the town and asked them to sit as witnesses. These two men are going to settle a legal matter, and they need someone to notarize the deed. If you've ever closed on a house, you know you've got to have a notary there. They've got to stamp that deed. And so he pulls together quickly 12 other powerful people, which gives us an indication to how powerful Boaz is. Verse 3, it says, and Boaz said to the family redeemer, you know, Naomi, who came back from Moab, she is selling the land that belongs to our relative Elimelech. So Boaz is already beginning to push the boundaries of the law. You see, this land has value. Otherwise, it would be lost to a different tribe or a different family. And so technically speaking, it needs to be sold, but it needs to be sold by a man because a woman's only value was to give birth to a man. But Boaz is changing the law. He's reinterpreting the law. He already has given Naomi the right to sell the land, as if he considers women's as equals. How dare him here? Verse 4 says, I thought I should speak to you about it so that you can redeem it if you wish. If you want the land, then buy it here in the presence of these witnesses. But if you don't want it, let me know right away, because I am next in line to redeem it after you. So Boaz says, you've got first dibs, but act fast because I'm next in line. So to redeem land, you want to redeem something, it means to purchase something. To redeem land, there's an upfront expense. You got to buy the land. This land had been sitting for a long time. It's in disrepair, so you had to clean up the land. You had to take an inventory on all the livestock. There was a lot to do, so it was an initial heavy investment. But with the lack of an heir to this land, it's kind of a no-brainer. You buy the land, you put in some money, but you double your wealth overnight, and you get the income production from the land. So it'd be like me coming to you and say, hey, I've got some options on Tesla stock for $5 a share. You get to buy them. Let me know if you want them. Otherwise, let me know because I'm next in line and I'm ready. That's how this is going. It says, the man, has no name, replied, all right, I'll redeem it. But as they sign the paperwork, it says this, Boaz told him this little note. He says, of course, 
Your purchase of the land from Naomi also requires that you marry Ruth, the Moabite. That way she can have children who can carry on her husband's name and keep the land in the family. Suddenly, this lucrative investment is now a high-stakes gamble. It goes like this. If this no-name man marries Ruth and she stays barren, he inherits everything. It's winner, winner, chicken dinner. But if Ruth conceives a son, then her son will inherit the land. And all that money he paid for the land, all the investment to fix it up, will go to Ruth's son. So we're told this in verse 6. He says, then I can't redeem it. The family redeemer replied, because this might endanger my own estate. You redeem the land. I cannot do it. The risk is too high. It's just not worth it. Verse 7 says, now in those days... It was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase to remove his sandal and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. Apparently, this is far enough away from when this happened that this writer is retelling this story. They said, back in the day, you didn't shake a man's hand. You gave him your sandal. We stopped that because there were too many guys walking around with one sandal on. That is my bad dad joke for the night. Verse 8 says, so the other family redeemer drew off his sandal and he said to Boaz, good luck to you. You buy the land. Verse 9 says, then Boaz said to the elders and to the crowd standing around, you are my witnesses that today I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. And with the land I have acquired Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malon, to be my wife. This way she can have a son to carry on the family name, which is most important, of her dead husband, and to inherit the family property here in this hometown. You are all my witnesses today. And verse 11 says, Then these elders and all the people standing at the gate replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. May you prosper in Ephrath and be famous in Bethlehem. And may the Lord give you descendants by this young woman who will be like those of our ancestor Perez, the son of Tamar in Judah. What I want us to see here, before anyone knows how this story is going to turn out, whether or not Ruth is going to have a son, this social, cultural, religious outsider has already been embraced as one of them. And that's the climax of this story, which now only leaves us resolution and an epilogue and a lot of bass from the building behind us. Verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. We have mom number two of the story. It's taken us all the way to get to the end, but we have mom number two. Ruth is a mother. She has a child, which means in a male-dominated society, her family now has a future. And so now we move into the epilogue. And in the epilogue of the story, the writer turns back to the woman of the story he started with. You remember where we started? I said, this should be the book of Naomi, not the book of Ruth, because that whole first chapter was about Naomi. So as we turn to these final verses, we're looking at Naomi, Mara, Job, the one God turned against. It says in verse 14, then the women... Perhaps these are the same women who heard Naomi call herself Mara of the town, said to Naomi, praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. Verse 15 says, may he restore your youth and care for you in your old age, for he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and is is better than you to you than seven sons. That's a huge statement. In a patriarchal society where it's all about the man and it's all about the sons, she's just been told that this daughter is better than seven sons. And if you don't know anything about Scripture, anytime you hear the word seven, it simply means perfect or complete. And so she's being told that Ruth is better than the most perfect son. That is a huge statement in 1000 B.C., 
One of the books I've been reading as I go through the teaching of this is a book called The Gospel of Ruth, uh, and the title is Loving God Enough to Break the Rules, which is where we pull some of that from. It's written by Cur- Carolyn James. But she writes this. She says, Older women counted on their sons to care for them, to protect them from exploitation and the harsh elements of society, to be their voice, to stand up for their rights, and to preserve their father's name and estate by bringing the next generation of male descendants into the world. Ruth did all of those things for Naomi at great cost to herself and in a culture that tied her hands behind her back, denied her a voice, refused her access to the legal system, and regarded her as useless. It was all uphill for Ruth, but she did it anyway. Not even seven sons would have done as much. And so as we come to the end of this story, it can be really easy to just check And they all lived happily ever after. But I think we are delusional if we think that those who've experienced deep tragedy, like Naomi, like Ruth, somehow someday escape the weight of that grief. No matter how many good things happen to them after the loss, Naomi will go to her grave in sorrow and mourning the loss of her dead husband and her dead sons. Her life will be marked by those waves of grief after grief. And so this is undeniably a sad story. Phyllis Tribble, a biblical scholar, she says this. She says, sad stories do not have happy endings, but sad stories may yield new beginnings. Naomi, a mother, a grandmother, And her story is a gift to the church. We got to see her doubts. We got to see her ask hard questions. We got to watch her brutally engage with God. And then we got to watch God yield new beginnings within her sad story. And so verse 16, it says, Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast And she cared for him as if he were her own. The neighbor women, they say a lot of stuff, it appears, says, now at last Naomi has a son again. This child is a child that gets to have two moms, Ruth and Naomi. Two moms raising a very important child in God's story of redemption. Goes on and says, and they named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, and Jesse the grandfather of David. Ruth, this cultural non-entity, is now the great-grandmother of King David. That's the story of the Bible. That's why I love teaching the Bible. It is constantly who the world calls the nobody, God makes the hero. Verse 18 through 21, then, we get this genealogical record. This is the genealogical record of their ancestor, Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amenadad. Amenadad was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. And I almost missed it. We just got the third mother in this story perhaps even the most important mother in the story. Salmon, who was mentioned there, because they only mentioned the men, Salmon had a wife whose name was Rahab. And Rahab is known throughout Scripture simply as Rahab the prostitute. Let that sink in for a moment. Boaz's mom, that good dude, that powerful man, his mom is Boaz or is Rahab the prostitute. So that means that Ruth isn't the first woman that Boaz has known that has left her native land to seek refuge with God and his people. If you don't know the story of Rahab, several decades earlier, Joshua, one of the judges, sent two Israelite spies across the border into Canaan, and they were going in to get the lay of the land in Israel, and they were going to prepare to invade. The spies find lodging with a woman who had to sell herself as a sex worker to support herself because she is destitute and desperate. Her name was Rahab. Rahab protects these men. They turn her in and they rescue her and her family. Later, Rahab, back in Israel now, marries a Jewish
Turkish man, his name is Salmon, and becomes a mother to a child named Boaz. Rahab tells Boaz stories. She tells him about the horrific death of a concubine in Judges 19. She tells him what it's like to be a woman who is abused and used by men. She tells Boaz how God's people became a refuge for her as an outsider. How this helped grow her faith in the Lord to see beyond the letter of the law and to see God's heart in his law. Boaz was a safe person for Ruth because he had a mother who taught him not to mimic the toxic culture around him, but to boldly protect those the culture deemed less than. Let that be an encouragement for you moms in here tonight. Just that impact you are having on your children, just telling them stories, just reminding them of the past or maybe even of your past and the impact that may have for generations to come. And let that be a reminder to all of us here tonight, the impact that we can have by refuge being a safe place for all people. There's one more verse. This is the final one. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. We've heard that before, right? It's repeated here again. We want to make sure we get this. From Naomi and Ruth's perspective as mothers, they are raising this rambunctious little boy that would continue their family name, but they're also raising the grandfather of the king of Israel. And so without learning of the bold and courageous faith of his great-grandma Ruth, do you think David would have had the defiant faith to fight Goliath? You know, little Obed, and I was thinking of little Elijah the other day when I came here and you were working, and little Obed, he learned lessons from his moms about sacrificial love and sacrificial grace. He got to hear their stories. He got to learn from their losses. He got to hear them get angry with God. And he will be reminded how God redeemed their family over and over again, giving them shelter beneath his wings. And that little rambunctious Obed he hears those stories and lessons from his mom, and they take deep root. And he passes those lessons along to his son, Jesse, along with his wife, who then pass those lessons along to their son, David, who continues to pass those same lessons on to us today. Psalm 23, David teaches us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. David got that from grandpa, from great grandpa, from great, great grandma, Ruth. The story is a microcosm of scripture. I mean, this is the story of the Bible all within one story, which means it's a microcosm of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. This is the gospel in the story. Just like Ruth, without a redeemer, we have no hope. Just like Naomi, we have inherited what looks like an empty life. Like both of them, we are desperate and we are destitute. We are unsafe as immigrants and foreigners trying to live in God's holy land. And just like Ruth and just like Naomi, God has provided someone who could step in and be our redeemer. 1 Peter 1, 18, it says this, For you know that God paid a ransom to redeem you from the empty life you inherited. And it was not paid with gold or silver. It was paid with the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to sing one last time. Jesus comes to earth, God comes to earth, bound by the law. Just like Boaz, there was a law that there was no way around. The law was that sin required payment, and that payment was death. The only way to redeem humanity was to make that payment. And he knew the gamble. He knew the odds. He knew that most people he died to save, they wouldn't even accept the gift that he gave. And he did know the great and terrible cost, that by paying off our debt, he was gambling everything. The love of his father, his very own life. But on the cross, he closed the deal. And all the witnesses there heard him proclaim, it is finished. 
who the world called a nobody from the little town of Bethlehem. God once again made the hero of the greatest story ever told. Why don't you stand? Let's proclaim and praise that as we close tonight.